Welcome back! If you remember from last time, we were talking about the causes of the Great Depression. Today, we're going to be looking at the government's response, and particularly President Herbert Hoover. So Herbert Hoover, who takes office in 1929, after Calvin Coolidge decides not to run again, is another Republican, and he decides to really stick behind the Republican values of laissez-faire when first confronted with what we labeled last time as a downward spiral. Remember those causes, the stock market crash, the bank failure, overproduction and underconsumption, unemployment starting to really escalate. He tries to limit the government's involvement in the business crisis, and he assures Americans, prosperity is around the corner. And he says, mutual self-help through voluntary giving. Meaning, rely on your churches, rely on all your humanitarian organizations. Don't rely on the government to be the one to help you. And he does so by promoting what he calls rugged individualism. And keeping with that idea to try to fix the nation's issue, especially in response to the Great Depression, Congress proposes the Hawley Smoot Tariff. And this tariff was on imported goods meant to protect industry and agriculture. Europe responds in turn by raising their tariffs on American goods, and, a result, as, and as a result, America's farmers and businessmen were unable to sell their excess goods to other countries. And this is where international trade grinds to a halt. And that's true, but if you were to look up the Holly Smoot Tariff, it would come up as the Smoot Holly Tariff. For some reason, we see in the New York State region's Holly Smoot Tariff. So it's just playing with the two guys' names there. But it does. Trade will grind to a halt, and many people will try to ask Hoover, please don't sign this into law. Veto it. Veto it. Economists said this will not be a good thing. They predicted that trade would grind to a halt. And guess what? It did. Even though Hoover signed it into law, he chose not to veto it. And if you take a look at this graph, world trade, it will steeply decline. And this will send the world into more of a depression rather than just the United States itself. So Hoover notices that laissez-faire economics is not helping out the American public, and that the Great Depression is not getting better, it's getting worse. So in turn, he proposes the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, known as the RFC, which loaned money to banks, railroads, and insurance companies to save businesses and jobs. It was around $238 million to all of these different areas, and he hoped the loans would stimulate the economy and companies would begin hiring individuals and creating more jobs. Prosperity then would trickle down throughout the economy. It would eventually reach the average person. So let's explore this economic theory of trickle-down economics a little bit further. See, the idea is the RFC in this situation would give loans to businesses who would then invest more in their business, then hiring more workers, who would then have money to spend and would then buy more goods. And that would hopefully pick the economy back up. But for Hoover, it was a little bit too late in the game, and it didn't necessarily help things. Hoover also attempted to jumpstart the economy through creating more opportunities for people to get jobs and work. And he did this through public works, where the federal government would sponsor projects such as the Hoover Dam, where people would work and earn a paycheck and hopefully pay off some of those loans. However, too little, too late, as Mr. Valencourt said. So even though Hoover eventually comes around to the idea of government intervention in the Depression to try to stimulate the economy, we said over and over again now, too little, too late, the American public was suffering. The unemployment was extremely high. By 1933, it'll reach 25%. And as a result of people losing their jobs, you'll see a lot of people starting to lose their homes as well. So you will see shanty towns or villages of shacks sprout up all around the country where homeless people lived. And they will gain the nickname Hoovervilles. And they will sleep underneath Hoover blankets, which are old newspapers. And this all shows an interesting phenomenon. It shows who they are attributing blame to for where they are in life, for the fact that they're homeless, for the fact that the depression is getting worse. By nicknaming all these things after President Hoover, they're placing some blame in his lap. As President Hoover's first term is coming to a close, there is one group that really stages a dramatic outcry against the government's handling of this Great Depression. The veterans of World War I had been promised 
after World War I in 1924 of $1,000 bonuses which they could redeem and cash in on in 1945. However, with the economic crisis that's going on, the Great Depression, these veterans, among other people, were feeling the strain financially. So they begin looking to put some pressure on Washington to get these bonuses or get some money coming their way. They're not really making any headway. So then what we'll see is the what will be termed as the bonus army will march down to Washington. And they will, for lack of a better term, term occupy Washington, if you will. Much if we take a look at the Occupy moving going on today. But they had already been promised this from the government. So they'll show up to sort of demand their bonuses. And it's not met very well from the Senate or President Hoover, who opted not to pay them early and forced them to leave Washington, D.C. This will create horrible press for President Hoover, who is about to head into a re-election campaign. If you take a look at the pictures, you'll see the sheer number of veterans who had made their way to Washington, D.C., sprouting up their own shanty towns, or Hoovervilles, if you will, in front of the Capitol as well. And then, lastly, you'll see the destruction of those shanty towns at the hands of the government. This was this instance or this issue, this occurrence was covered nationwide. And veterans who were under assault, there were pictures and videos posted everywhere. And this, like Mr. Vancourt said, haunted President Hoover throughout his re-election campaign in 1932. And in this election of 1932, President Hoover is going to face a formidable opponent with a well-established uh, last name in Franklin Delano Roosevelt, a charismatic Democrat from New York who pledges to the American people a new deal. It will be an uphill battle for Hoover heading into the re-election re cycle. We will see. Will he get re-elected or will America have a new president? But that won't be until next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>